I would like to welcome everyone this evening to the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation Civil War Roundtable. As you know, we hold a roundtable every other month, and we've been able to get some extraordinary speakers. This evening's speaker is historian Kevin Pollock, who is the historic site manager for the Prince William County Historic Preservation Division. And he also works as a licensed battlefield guide at Antietam National Battlefield. He sits on the board of directors of the Shepherdstown Battlefield Preservation Association, as well as the Safe Historic Antietam Foundation, which is an extraordinary group of individuals who are really committed to the preservation and interpretation of the Antietam National Battlefield. He's the author of Shepherdstown in the Civil War, One Vast Confederate Hospital, and co-authored To Has It All, a book that I have, and I'm very pleased to own it, A Guide to the Maryland Campaign. And lastly, uh, Kevin has an important role as the editorial board chairman of Emerging Civil War. So it's with a great deal of pleasure that I'm able to introduce tonight's speaker, Kevin Pollock. Battle of Brandy Station fought on June 9th, 1863. And in my reading of the Gettysburg campaign, prior to that, interpret the Gettysburg campaign, it is that you have the Battle of Brandy Station, one of the largest cavalry actions of the American Civil War and fought on the North American continent up to that point. And then uh, essentially the armies just march through Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania, and they meet at Gettysburg on July 1st, 1863. And so it was really refreshing for me to be able to work within the Loudoun Valley to get a good sense of these three cavalry battles, again, fought over five days from June 17th to the 21st of 1863, because they are just an incredibly well-preserved set of battlefields. Um, despite the, the amount of ground that they cover, they're, they're preserved by many different easements that many different organizations hold. Uh, Nova Parks is doing an excellent job at building basically an Aldi Middleburg and Upperville battlefield that includes sites like Mount Zion Church, Aldi Mill, um, Mount Defiance and Goose Creek Bridge right there along Route 50 that's managed by a great friend of mine, Tracy Gillespie. And so if you haven't been out there to see any of those sites related to these battlefields, I would highly suggest it because if you want to see the back roads and the open fields that Civil War Cavalry fought on in June of 1863 on the road to Gettysburg, there's very few battlefields that are better suited to understanding what men saw at the time of those actions and the fights at Aldi Middleburg and Upperville. So without further ado, we're going to get right into it. And we are going to pick up our story where most stories of the Gettysburg campaign, in my opinion, leave off. And that is the end of the Battle of Brandy Station. Again, that battle fought in Culpeper County, south of the Rappahannock River on June 9th, 1863, when Jeb Stewart and his Confederate cavalrymen were initially surprised, but then were able to ultimately blunt the attacks of the Union cavalry uh, under the command of Alfred Pleasanton, the cavalry commander of the Army of the Potomac. Jeb Stewart is, of course, going to be a figure that that uh, focuses or is is very central to the story of Aldi Middleburg and Upperville. But as, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, Stewart came under a lot of flack and under a lot of fire for his performance after the Battle of Brandy Station. Before these battles at Aldi Middleburg and Upperville in the Gettysburg campaign, what would arguably be Stewart's most controversial campaign in the course of the American Civil War. The Richmond Examiner, one of the main newspapers in Richmond, had this to say about Jeb Stewart and his cavalry in the Confederate Army. He said, quote, this much puffed cavalry of the Army of Northern Virginia has been twice, if not three times, surprised. And such repeated accidents can be regarded as nothing but the necessary consequences of negligence and bad management. The country pays dearly for the blunders. And of course, Jeb Stewart was one who was not to take such a slight very lightly. Whether or not this influenced his performance in the Gettysburg campaign is certainly something that's up for debate uh, and something I'd be happy to shed at least my opinion on uh, later on in the question and answer session. But nonetheless, Stewart is under a bit of controversy, a uh, shadow of controversy as the uh, Army of Northern Virginia continues moving north uh, across the Potomac River into Maryland and then ultimately across the Mason-Dixon line into Pennsylvania as well. So about a week after the Battle of Brandy Station, the evening of July, uh, excuse me, of June 16th, 1863, uh, the Army of the Potomac is still relatively mobilized, uh, immobilized uh, southwest and west of the nation's capital at Washington, D.C., because the Army Commander Joseph Hooker cannot get a firm grasp of exactly where Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia are and what their intentions are. And so Hooker, like any uh, Civil War commander, is going to rely upon his cavalry uh, 
And uh, there he is up in the upper right hand corner, the commander of Hooker's Cavalry, Alfred Pleasanton, known by many newspaper men as the Knight of Romance, not so much for his romantic proclivities towards women, but instead for his um, uh, tendency to inflate in the course of the Civil War and in different cavalry operations. But nonetheless, Hooker is going to turn to Pleasanton to be the one to figure out exactly where Lee is and what he is up to. Uh, night that uh, Daniel Butterfield, Joseph Hooker's chief of staff, will give the orders to Pleasanton's cavalry to begin moving west across the Bull Run Mountains and into the Loudoun Valley to find Lee's army. Uh, Butterfield is going to tell Pleasanton, it is better that we should lose men than to be without knowledge of the enemy. Leave nothing undone to give him, meaning the commanding general Hooker, the fullest information. And so you can see just how dire the lack of information is on Hooker's part in terms of what he's trying to figure out about the Confederate Army's dispositions there uh, on its march north, ultimately into Maryland and Pennsylvania. So really, if, to, to sum it up, the battles of Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville is a battle for information. Uh, Alfred Pleasanton is going to be the one seeking that information, trying to get that information back to Joseph Hooker. And the man in the bottom left there, somebody we've already talked about a, a little bit, James Ewell Brown or Jeb Stewart commanding the cavalry of the Army of Northern tasked with depriving Pleasanton of that information. And so this is not so much a battle fought over territory or a series of battles fought over territory, but instead it is going to be an action where Jeb Stewart is ultimately going to be trading space for time. He's trying to buy time for the Army of Northern Virginia to get uh, on the west side of the Blue Ridge Mountains, which you can see towards the left side of the map. Uh, into the Shenandoah Valley and then move north across the Potomac River. So Stuart is going to be that shield, that closed door, if you will, that will prevent Pleasanton from seeing that as long as his men can fight well, uh, as of course, as I mentioned, as the Richmond Examiner has just questioned. So the morning of June 17th of 1863, Alfred Pleasanton is going to begin moving his cavalry west along the Little River Turnpike, essentially along what's now today U.S. Route 50, known as the John Mosby Highway, uh, heading towards a gap in the Bull Run Mountains that is known as the Aldi Gap. You can see that uh, the little town of Aldi, not much bigger today than it was in 1863, sitting right there at the center part of the map in between the Bull Run Mountains. Of course, the battles, as I've mentioned, that I'll refer to as AMU, as we use as a shortcut, Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville, you can see all three of those towns in between the Bull Run Mountains and the Blue Ridge Mountains, about 20 miles to the west of the Bull Run Mountains. And these uh, towns are all going to figure prominently in Pleasanton's quest for information from June 17th. Uh, to be Pleasanton's first objective, it's an incredibly important town to capture because if he can capture that, not only will that deprive Stuart and the Confederate cavalry of using the Bull Run Mountains as a screen to prevent uh, Pleasanton from seeing the Confederate infantry moving north through the Shenandoah Valley. But you can also see the two dark lines that emanate west and northwest from the town of Aldi. The, the line that goes west through Middleburg, Rector's Crossroads, and then ultimately Upperville is the continuation of the Little River Turnpike. Once it gets into the Loudoun Valley, it is known as the Ashby's Gap Turnpike, again, still modern U.S. Route 50 today. And then the line that runs through uh, Mountville, Philemont, and Snickersville and leads into Snickers Gap in the Blue Ridge Mountains is the Snickersville Turnpike. Uh, Route 234 today, you can still drive that, and we'll be talking quite a bit that, about that road when it comes to the Battle of Aldi fought on June 17th of 1863. Now, of course, we're, we're coming up on the anniversary of these battles, and you can already see the weather that we've had here in Northern Virginia. I think it reached 91 uh, today in Manassas. Uh, in June 17th, uh, that day, it was uh, very hot. It was about 94 degrees that day. The next day, June 18th, it would reach 100 degrade by most accounts. And so these actions are going to be fought over very, very warm days. And of course, that's going to diminish the amount of troops that both sides can bring to the action as heat exhaustion and straggling takes command uh, of both armies. But nonetheless, by the early afternoon of June 17th, the van of Pleasanton's cavalry under the command of Judson Kilpatrick is going to arrive in Aldi. There's a brief skirmish right there in the midst of uh, the town of Aldi itself. But then uh, Confederate positions uh, under the command of uh, Thomas Munford, a brigade commander, uh, are going to be positioned west of Aldi to try and blunt the federal incursion here into the, uh, the Loudoun Valley itself. 
The first major action that's going to take place at Aldi is uh, there at the bottom of your map. You can see the Ashby's Gap Turnpike, again, modern Route 50, centered around the Adam Farm. You can still drive right through that today and see that. Uh, where this action took place, but about 50 dismounted cavalrymen of the 5th Virginia Cavalry under the command of Reuben Boston would fight uh, elements of, of two different units. Turnpike. Boston was actually going to uh, have most of his force surrounded uh, and would have to surrender his force, which was another black eye, as you can imagine, in the eyes of the Richmond newspapers on Jeb Stewart and the performance of his cavalry as compared to their Union counterparts. And so the Battle of Aldi does not begin all that well for the federal troops themselves. As more and more federal cavalry begins to arrive, Pleasanton is going to send um, some of his troops or troopers up the Snickersville Turnpike, which you can see basically uh, extends upwards into the map and then out the uh, the top left-hand corner of the map itself. And one of the first regiments to arrive is the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry, a regiment that's going to feature prominently in the action here at Aldi itself. The 1st Massachusetts will uh, move up the Snickersville Turnpike uh, towards a bend in the road around the fur farm, which you can see in the top portion of the map itself. I'll show a couple of modern pictures from that area in just a moment. But uh, the first Massachusetts, as it's moving up the Snickersville Turnpike, is actually going to drive almost all the way to the fur farm itself before Henry Lee Higginson, the gentleman pictured there in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, believes that the advance guards of the first Massachusetts Cavalry have actually gone out too far, too far beyond the federal lines and pull back the man leading the van of the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry. And that is a, an artist turned soldier by the name of Captain Lucius Sargent, who is there in the top right hand corner of the screen. Uh, as Sargent is being ordered to pull back along the Snickersville Turnpike, eventually the Confederate troops will stop pursuing him. And somewhere about halfway between the town of Aldi and the fur farm itself, uh, Sergeant, as the rest of the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry pulls back closer to Aldi, Sergeant is going to stop himself on top of a hill, and he's going to turn around, face the Confederate soldiers while in the saddle, and begin making what one uh, eyewitness described as obscene hand gestures towards the Confederate cavalrymen. I'll leave that up to your own imagination exactly what Sergeant is doing, but uh, this is certainly a man that's up for a fight. Uh, Higginson saw what he was doing, and so Higginson rode up to Sergeant, tried to coax him back towards the main body of the 1st Massachusetts, but by that point, uh, Sergeant and Higginson were overwhelmed by charging Confederate cavalry, no doubt egged on by Sergeant's obscene hand gestures, and uh, in the midst of a very brief action, Sergeant would be wounded, uh, same with another member of the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry, and so would Henry Lee Higginson. In fact, Higginson was slashed across his face. He also received uh, a bullet wound in the small of his back that knocked him off. In the midst of the Snickersville Turnpike, a Confederate soldier came up to him and started robbing Higginson of all the contents of his pockets. Higginson reached around to his back, realized the bullet-sized hole in his back itself, uh, believed that to be a mortal wound, and so essentially told this Confederate officer, uh, Confederate soldier, not to worry about robbing him too soon because in just a few short moments, Higginson was going to be dead. Uh, ultimately, incredibly enough, Higginson did not die. He lived until November 14th, 1919. And you can see in this post-war picture taken of him, that deep scar along the right side of his face, uh, still bearing the wounds from the Battle of Aldi on June 17th, 1863. Higginson would lead an incredibly uh, dynamic career. He founded the uh, uh, Boston Symphony Orchestra uh, in Massachusetts in the years after the war. And actually, if any of you are familiar with Harvard University, uh, Soldier Field, the first athletic field at Harvard University, was built on land donated by Henry Lee Higginson. And that land is now where the Harvard baseball team plays its baseball games. And so Higginson went on to a much storied career beyond uh, surviving that very serious wound that he believed he had suffered uh, along the Snickersville Turnpike itself. The engagements do will devolve into counter charge after counter charge of federal troops surging up the Snickersville Turnpike, um, Confederate troops charging back in the fields south of the Snickersville Turnpike to drive the Federals back towards Aldi. And one of the other units that's going to be thrown into the action, the midst of the action here, is what was described by one. Uh, contemporary of the Army of the Potomac's cavalry branch as a peculiar 
polyglot regiment, and that was the 4th New York Cavalry, made up of men from many different nationalities. But the man leading the 4th New York Cavalry this day on June 17th was Luigi Palma de Cesnola. He was actually a, a descendant from an Italian count dating all the way back to the 12th century. De Cesnola comes across uh, to America in the years uh, leading up to the American Civil War, but uh, he does not uh, suffer uh, lightly at the hands of Alfred Pleasanton, who is very much a, a nativist uh, at that point. De Cesnola being an immigrant does not get along with Pleasanton all that well. In fact, just a few weeks uh, earlier prior to this battle, just regiment, his original regiment, the 4th New York Cavalry, but instead was commanding a brigade of cavalry, but would be demoted uh, by Pleasanton due to Pleasanton's perceived uh, poor performance of De Chesnola at the Battle of Brandy Station. And even that morning, June 17, 1863, as De Chesnola was moving his men through uh, a federal infantry camp on their way towards Aldi, De Chesnola would be placed under arrest for moving his troops right through the middle of an infantry camp. De Chesnola was then back with Pleasanton, back with uh, uh, Kilpatrick, watching the action unfold on the field south of the Snickersville Turnpike. And as the 4th New York Cavalry charged into one uh, uh, charge and then was driven back, De Chesnola, actually without his sword because he was under arrest, charged back into the ranks and helped lead his men into a second charge. During that second charge, they were then repulsed, driven back once again. When uh, Brigade Commander Justin Kilpatrick witnessed De Chesnola's heroics, he supposedly, according to one account, had one of his staff officers hand his own sword over to De Chesnola with a, uh, while wielding a sword. And one of the lines that uh, supposedly Kilpatrick had said to De Chesnola was to bring the sword back bloody. And there is an image on the right. You can see De Chesnola leading the men of the 4th New York Cavalry into the fight at Aldi. De Chesnel himself would be wounded. He would eventually be captured, but for his heroics that day, he would be the only Union soldier to eventually receive the Congressional Medal of Honor for the actions that he performed in the field south of the Snickersville Turnpike on June 17th. Just like Henry Lee Higginson, though, De Chesnel's um, story does not end on June 17th, 1863. I'm sure you will recognize the man on the right side of the screen here, perhaps not the man on the left side of the screen, but De Chesnola does sort of become his own form of Indiana Jones in the years after the American Civil War. He actually goes to uh, Cyprus outside of Turkey, and there he is involved in taking uh, many thousands of different uh, artifacts and antiquities from the Middle East back to North America, and he helps to display them in the uh, the New York Metropolitan Museum, uh, and he becomes actually the first director of the Met uh, there in downtown New York. Uh, however, De Chesnola's efforts at bringing back a lot of these antiquities came under fire. Uh, even today, uh, many European and, and uh, Middle Eastern governments actually criticize him for not uh, for stealing some of these antiquities and bringing them back to North America rather than dealing it uh, through law. So he becomes his own Indiana Jones in a sort of way. Uh, of course, I'm sure Harrison Ford's character was not modeled quite after De Chesnola, but it gives you a good modern perspective of what De Chesnola will do uh, throughout the rest of his life, ultimately. De Chesnola's heroics, though, are not going to be enough to drive Confederate troops away from the bend in the road uh, at uh, the fur farm along the Snickersville Turnpike. <laughs> Here is that bend in the road as it looks today. It is the same exact configuration as it was in June of 1863. We're standing where this photograph was taken. Uh, looking from the Union perspective, you can see that bend in the road. There is a stone wall running from our left to our right. That's where Confederate troops of the 2nd Virginia Cavalry were positioned. There is at least one artillery piece on the hillside behind that stone wall, but uh, you can see this blind turn that federal troops had to uh, maneuver, and as they made that blind turn, they fell into point-blank range of the Confederate troopers manning the positions behind that stone wall. The fight here becomes incredibly intense, very close quarters, and as one member of the 2nd Virginia Cavalry positioned behind that stone wall wrote, he said, quote, I was so close to these men as they charged by me that I could see the dust fly from their blue jackets as the bullets from our revolve 15 feet from them. I saw at least one of their horses shot when running at full speed, throwing its rider over its head. Of course, the rider was run over by his comrades behind. 
Not a man of this squadron ever got back. Many were killed, the most were captured. One of the men leading one of the squadrons of the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry in its disjointed attacks against this bend in the road in the Snickersville Turnpike was Charles Francis Adams, the grandson and great-grandson of Presidents uh, John Adams and John Quincy Adams uh, prior to this. Adams, Charles Francis Adams led 94 men into action along the Snickersville Turnpike. 60 of his men became casualties of the action there at that bend in the road. And just a day after the action on June 18th, uh, Adams wrote a letter back to his father. And you can uh, find this letter published in his letters. But if you've ever seen the actual original letter, you can see that as Adams begins to talk about this experience that he had with his men along the Snickersville Turnpike, that his handwriting begins to degenerate. And you can, you can really sense the trauma that he experienced that previous day and that he still other. But uh, he said, I went into action with 94 men in my squadron and came out with between 30 and 40. My poor men were just slaughtered, and all we could do was to stand still and be shot down. The men fell right and left, and the horses were shot through and through. I couldn't charge except across a ditch, up a hill, and over two high stone walls, from behind which the enemy were slaying us. In a second, the Rebs were riding, yelling, and slashing among us. The 1st Massachusetts Cavalry uh, entered the Battle of Aldi with 294 mounted officers and men. It suffered 198 casualties, a casualty rate of over 66%. More than two-thirds of the men of the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry that rode into Aldi that day did not make it out of action, uh, whether they were killed, wounded, captured, or missing. 66% casualties is a high casualty rate for an infantry regiment during the course of the Civil War, but for a cavalry regiment especially, this is incredibly high. And I have never been able to, perhaps somebody can correct me in the uh, question and answer session, and I'm happy to be corrected about this, but I have never seen another cavalry regiment north or south during the entire Civil War suffer as high of a casualty rate as the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry suffers here on June 17, 1863. The monument there that you see on the right side of the screen is an incredibly touching monument positioned right there at the bend in the road. And I'm showing you just one side here in this photograph, but also etched on the other side are the names of every single casualty that that cavalry regiment suffers on June 17th. It was put up in the 1890s, actually on ground owned by a former Confederate soldier by the name of Dallas Fur, who was a member of John Mosby's. Uh, 43rd Battalion of Virginia Cavalry, whom we'll talk more about in just a moment here. Um, but uh, one of the absolute best spots, in my opinion, to uh, to really understand the carnage of a Civil War battlefield is right at that bend in the Snickersville Turnpike. And I talked about the incredible state of preservation that these battlefields are in. The fur farm is still standing today, uh, just a, a stone's throw from where this monument sits. The bend in the Snickersville Turnpike is still a dangerous bend today, as it just uh, just as it was in 1863. Actually, many years ago, VDOT actually tried to straighten it out, but local preservation has stepped in to preserve this deadly bend in the road because of how much it played into the action at the Battle of Aldi itself. Um, Thomas Munford, the Confederate Cavalry Brigade commander, later wrote of this bend in the road. He said, I do not hesitate to say that I have never seen as many Yankees killed in the same space of ground in any fight I have ever seen or on any battlefield in Virginia that I have been over. Ultimately, despite the high uh, casualties that Union troops will suffer, especially the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry, the 1st Maine Cavalry is going to be brought into the action under the command of its Colonel, Kelvin Dowdy. They will drive the Confederate troopers away from that stone wall, seize the Snickersville Turnpike. But in the process, Kelvin Dowdy is going to be killed in the action. He is the highest ranking federal officer to lose his life during the battles of Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville during those five days in the Loudoun Valley itself. Back at Middleburg, just a few miles west of Aldi, where Jeb Stewart had established his headquarters, uh, he could no doubt hear the echoes of the battles going on at Aldi itself, but Stewart was enjoying himself there in downtown Middleburg uh, at his headquarters, which today is the Red Fox Inn that sits at the only intersection where there is a stoplight in downtown Middleburg. That's what you see pictured uh, behind uh, Stuart in this photograph. You can see Stuart sort of in the center, uh, raising up his right hand to salute his famed scout. And now, as of a week, uh, commander of the 43rd Battalion of Virginia Cavalry, John Singleton Mosby, better known as Mosby's Rangers. 
Most of these men had just been formed officially as the 43rd Battalion Virginia Cavalry just a week prior. He rode into Middleburg to report uh, to Stuart some information that he had, and then Mosby and his men actually prepared to launch a second raid, their second raid within a week, against federal encampments on the north shore of the Potomac River in Maryland. And so Mosby would then ride out of Middleburg and leave Stuart to enjoy the company of the Middleburg ladies. Harris von Bork, one of Stuart's staff officers that we'll talk about more in just a little bit, described um, uh, Stuart there in the streets of Middleburg, having the ladies of Middleburg dance around him as if it were a, as if he were a maypole. Uh, and so Stuart was incredibly thrilled at the reception he was receiving. Again, you uh, can only imagine the um, angst that he felt at reading his reviews, the reviews of his performance during the Battle of Brandy Station uh, from the Richmond Examiner and other Richmond newspapers. And here was Jeb Stuart in all of his glory. But then ultimately, uh, in the afternoon of the 17th, Stuart's glory would be shattered by federal cavalry riding not from the east, from the direction of Aldi, but instead riding in downtown Middleburg from the south. And that was the 280 men of the 1st Rhode Island Cavalry under the command of Alfred Duffier, another foreigner in the uh, federal cavalry in the Army of the Potomac. Duffier was uh, actually commanding a division at the Battle of Brandy Station, but was now demoted to commanding just one regiment of cavalry just a week later. Uh, and again, you can see the um, anti-immigrant perceptions of Alfred Pleasanton at work here when it comes to the command and chemistry of the Army of the Potomac's Cavalry Branch. But while Kilpatrick and the rest of the Army of the Potomac's Cavalry were moving from the east towards Aldi, uh, Duffier was sent through the uh, thoroughfare gap, a gap many miles to the south of Aldi, and then Duffier was supposed to work his way into Middleburg uh, scout the Loudoun Valley, patrol the Loudoun Valley, and then report back to Alfred Pleasanton and also ultimately to Army Commander Joseph Hooker about what uh, he had seen or not seen in the Loudoun Valley. And so uh, Duffier's Rhode Islanders shocks Stewart actually burg to the west in a very embarrassing moment. Duffier then quickly realized his plight, the fact that he was the only federal cavalry in the area around. And so his men became to, uh, began to barricade uh, the streets of Middleburg. Eventually, Stuart counterattacked with a couple of North Carolina cavalry regiments, drove Duffier out of Middleburg to the south. Uh, they engaged again the next morning on June 18th. And by the time Duffier and the 1st Rhode Island Cavalry made their way back to Centerville, Virginia, uh, their casualties were staggering. Um, the First Rhode Island lost six men killed, nine wounded, and 210 soldiers missing or captured out of 280 engaged. That is a casualty rate of 80%. Uh, unlike the First Massachusetts Cavalry, not many were missing or captured, and the First Rhode Island uh, was just a shell of its former self, and it was the uh, second uh, great defeat that that regiment had suffered in the Loudoun Valley within the last eight months, the other coming at Mountville on October 26th, uh, excuse me, October 31st, actually, uh, of 1862. But eventually the uh, pressure of the First Rhode Island behind Munford's cavalrymen and the pressure exerted by the Federal Cavalry coming out of Aldi drove Stewart's cavalry out of Aldi itself and back to Middleburg by the evening uh, of June 17th, about 300 casualties in that action there uh, at Aldi overall. But the action would not come to an end uh, on June 17th. In fact, it continued all the way into the night back with our famous partisan ranger, John Singleton Mosby. As I mentioned, Mosby had met with Stuart twice that morning on June 17th, and then he gathered his men to the north of Aldi where he was planning on a second raid into Maryland. Ultimately though, because of the heavy action that was occurring at Aldi, Mosby and his men sat out the fight they sat um, and listened to the action, but Mosby began to realize that he would be able to um, help the Confederate cause better by remaining in the Loudoun Valley rather than going into Maryland. And so the night of June 17th, after the action quieted down uh, at the town of Aldi, uh, Mosby began snaking his way through the federal lines in the rear of the federal lines, and he actually came upon a house of a unionist under the, uh, by the name of Almond Birch. And as Mosby and a few of his men, Mosby uh, dressed in a, a raincoat, as was his wont to shield the gray uniform that he was wearing in the dead of night, came upon the home of Alman Birch. He found one Union soldier holding on to the reins of several horses, several uh, unseated horses. And Mosby, in his very suave uh, personality, no doubt with a revolver underneath 
his uh, raincoat pointed at this Union soldier, just sort of very nonchalant, rode up to this Union soldier and uh, asked who he was and, and who he was holding these horses for. Uh, the man, thinking nothing of it, uh, told him that it was the, uh, the horses of the chief acting signal officer, Benjamin Fisher, of the Army of the Potomac and a major sterling of Joseph Hooker's staff. Uh, Mosby, immediately realizing the uh, treasure that he had just stumbled upon, uh, told this man, uh, he said, my name is Mosby and you are my prisoner. And as Mosby said that uh, just telling this Union soldier that his name was Mosby sort of put the soldier under a trance. And so he captured this man when Sterling and Fisher came out of Birch's home. He captured them as well. And uh, on both of them, they were carrying dispatches from Army headquarters to Pleasanton that detailed exactly what Alfred Pleasanton's plans were, uh, what he was supposed to do in the Loudoun Valley, where the different infantry corps of the Army of the Potomac were and where they were headed. And so as John Mosby called it, he described it as the open sesame to all of Hooker's plans. Mosby very quickly forwarded this information to Jeb Stewart and Stewart was able to arm himself with this information for the remaining four days of the Aldi Middleburg and Upperville Cavalry operations. What Stewart learned from it was simply that again, all he had to do was trade space for time. Stuart was not fighting these battles, would not fight these battles, to try and hold on to the Loudoun Valley itself, but to slow down the federal cavalry advance from the Bull Run Mountains, that uh, uh, brown or orange line you see in the center of the screen, towards the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Shenandoah Valley, which you see on the left side of your screen. Stuart was just trying to slow Pleasanton's cavalry down uh, to allow the Confederate infantry to make it north of Ashby's Gap, north of, of Winchester, and across the Potomac River into Maryland. Stuart knew that that was Pleasanton's objective because of the information that Mosby had given him, and so Stuart would fight to simply slow the Army of the Potomac's cavalry down, again, trading space for time. The next place that Stuart decided to fight for space over time uh, was at Mount Defiance, about a mile west of Middleburg, which is, of course, a great name for a place that uh, would become the center of the Battle of Middleburg, fought two days after Aldi on June 19th. Of 1863. Mount Defiance is not one of those names that gets its name from the Civil War action that occurs there. Instead, Mount Defiance is a name given to the area by its former landowners who uh, lost some of their land in a land dispute. Uh, the folks that won that land dispute who recovered their land, at least according as, to, as they saw it, um, named their land Mount Recovery. And so the folks here, the Chin family that lost part of that land, uh, named it Mount Defiance in defiance of Mount Recovery. Uh, but nonetheless, it makes a great name for a place to stage a cavalry or any defense for that matter during the course of the American Civil War. Stewart's line you can see extended on both sides of the Ashby's Gap Turnpike. Uh, he had several artillery pieces positioned along the turnpike itself, and this would prove a very tough nut to crack for um, uh, David Gregg's uh, Federal Cavalry, who were directed with moving due west along the Ashby's Gap Turnpike straight towards Ashby's Gap. The other uh, division of the Army of the Potomac's Cavalry under the command of John Buford moved north from Middleburg, searching for a way to get around the Confederate line and get behind Stewart's line to force it off of this high ground uh, at Mount Defiance. You can see a lot of blue arrows on this map, and I'm not going to go through each and every one. Uh, one of note, though, is what was described as a carbine assault by the 4th and 16th Pennsylvania Cavalry, while many of these charges were mounted charges moving right up Mount Defiance itself. The 4th and 16th Pennsylvania Cavalry is actually dismounted and charged with carbines, like what you see on the left side or the bottom left here of the screen itself, uh, helping to shatter uh, Beverly Roberts, Robertson's Confederates that held the right end of Stewart's line uh, itself. But it would take many repeated uh, and, and determined federal assaults up the Ashby's Gap Turnpike to ultimately drive Stewart off of Mount Defiance itself. And this fighting was incredibly intense. Just a couple of anecdotes and stories about some of the men that uh, witnessed the fighting here at Mount Defiance. Uh, one of those soldiers was one of the men in that car carbine assault, the 16th Pennsylvania Cavalry, that actually made its way uh, pretty close all the way up to where you see Mount Defiance and the blacksmith shop, which still stands today, both of which still stand today, uh, labeled on the map. And that man's name was Michael Logan. Uh, he was the orderly sergeant of the 16th Pennsylvania Cavalry. He would be wounded uh, multiple times during the action. He was actually wounded uh, one of his first wounds was a 
apparently pretty sad to the point where he was forced to lay underneath a tree, uh, sit underneath a tree rather, and with whatever ammunition he had left with his carbine, as Confederate troops came charging towards him on horseback, he was loading that carbine, putting it up to his shoulder and firing at the Confederate troops. And apparently he was so effective that Confederate pockets of Confederate troops began to focus on Logan himself. Once Logan's carbine ran out of ammunition, he then resorted to using his revolver uh, to fire. Uh, then when that ran out of ammunition, um, as Confederate troops ran up to him and began slashing him with their sabers and shooting him at point blank range with their revolvers, uh, Logan actually then used his carbine as a club to try and stop these Confederate soldiers. Uh, Logan, once uh, his carbine was knocked out of his hand, actually resorted to throwing rocks that he found underneath the tree at his Confederate attackers. Uh, incredibly, he was wounded a total of 11 times, including seven different saber cuts on his head. Uh, an incredible amount of wounds. Believe it or not, Michael Logan actually survived all 11 of those wounds. He came back into the Union Army, was wounded three more times before the end of the war in 1865. So he suffered a total of uh, 14 wounds during the course, just the last two years of the American Civil War. The thing that I find absolutely amazing about Michael Logan's story is it wasn't just those 14 wounds. That wasn't enough to kill him. He actually survived his first wife and three of his children and he lived until 1918 when he died in Pennsylvania, but clearly a testimony to the ferocity of the action there swirling around Mount Defiance in the blacksmith shop itself. The 10th New York Cavalry that you see there positioned in the center of the map along the Ashby's Gap Turnpike was one of those regiments that helped break the stalemate there atop Mount Defiance. Uh, they staged just like the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry did a few days prior, several different uh, charges up the roadway itself uh, one of those uh, charges was led by a Major Kemper of the 10th New York, and as his men were coming off the field, uh, Major Elva Waters of the same unit was forming his men for the attack. And Kemper, relating his experiences that his men had just suffered, he said, don't go into those woods, Waters, it's a slaughter pen. And Waters replied back, I have orders to go, and I am going. Surely he did lead his men into that action, and as one of his men wrote it, he said, we found the slaughter pen on entering the woods. I shall never forget the impression that terrible sight made on me. The dismounted rebels poured bullets into us like rain. To go forward meant death to every one of our little band. And yet forward they went. Uh, the pressure from these multiple assaults and also the pressure of John Buford beginning to feel towards the northern end of Stewart's line uh, forced Stewart to begin pulling his men off of Mount Defiance to another line at uh, a place called Bittersweet Farm, a very ironic place to fight a Civil War battlefield. But Stewart's final line that day would be at the Bittersweet Farm. As his men were pulling back off of Mount Defiance, Stewart himself rode amongst the soldiers Positioned alongside of him was one of his staff officers, a Prussian by birth, a giant of a man, if I remember correctly, he's about six feet, four inches tall, over 200 pounds, by the name of Harris von Bork. Bork was a uh, very eccentric man, just as Stuart was. He wore a uniform very similar to Stuart's with a plume sticking out of his hat, gold braid on the uniform. And as von Bork was trying to lead some of Stuart's cavalrymen off the field, he began to be targeted by some of the federal dismounted cavalry, those Pennsylvanians that I talked about earlier. And von Bork turned to Stuart and he yelled those words. He said, General, those Yankees are giving it rather hotly to me on your account. Uh, almost immediately upon saying that, von Bork felt a, a strong thrust uh, in his neck. It was a bullet that struck him in the throat. Uh, his horse, as you understandably so, uh, panicked uh, in the midst of all of this. And a couple of Stuart staff officers and friends of von Bork had to figure out a way to get this giant of a man off of his horse uh, so that the horse would not lead this wounded officer into the federal lines itself. One of those fellow staff officers remembered that von Bork, who was an excellent and very skilled horseman, had taught him a lesson uh, a few months prior about how to calm down a horse during significant action like this. And that was to take one of the ears of the horse, grab it tight and twist it around and that would control the horse. And so using that, um, Stuart's fellow staff officers were able to uh, slow down and calm down von Bork's horse and get him out of the action. Von Bork would survive the wound, but this was the last action that he experienced during the course 
of the American Civil War. And uh, I'm sure many of you might be familiar with von Borg's memoirs that he wrote, memoirs of the uh, uh, Confederate War of Independence, which is an excellent, if not uh, in some cases, inflated read of his experiences during the American Civil War. But nonetheless, if you are one of those people uh, that believes you should never waste a good story for the facts, then von Borg's uh, uh, memoirs is an excellent book to read, and it is a very fun read. Uh, nonetheless. But by June 19th now, Stuart uh, has pulled off the ground west of Middleburg to the Bittersweet Farm. So we have the A and the M completed, the Battle of Aldi on June 17th, uh, and then the Battle of Middleburg on June 19th, on Friday, June 19th. The next day, June 20th, just as they did on June 18th, there wouldn't be much action between the two sides. Both sides began to gather their strength, bring in more reinforcements into the Loudoun Valley itself, and then prepare for the next day's action. And actually on June 20th, uh, it rained significantly that day, and so it wouldn't have made very good for cavalry operations anyway. But come uh, the morning of June 21st, and actually throughout June 20th, Alfred Pleasanton, again that night of romance, was beginning to sense that there was more than just Jeb Stuart's cavalrymen in front of him. Uh, and this is what he had written back to his superior officer, Joseph Hookery. So we cannot force the gaps of the Blue Ridge in the presence of a superior force. It wasn't so much a superior force that was in front of Pleasanton and the federal cavalrymen, but instead a superior enemy. And Stuart was fighting his men excellently. He was using the terrain, the creeks, the hills, the bridges, the stone walls of the Loudoun Valley to his defensive advantage. And that actually convinced Pleasanton that it was not just cavalry in his front, but because of the dismounted nature with which most of Stuart's cavalry fought the actions at Aldi and Middleburg, that it was Confederate infantry in front of him as well. And so Pleasanton asked for reinforcements. Those reinforcements came in the form of James Barnes' 5th Corps Division and the infantry that would fight alongside the Federal Cavalry on uh, June 21st is a very well-known brigade of infantry in Civil War lore. Uh, that was the brigade under the command of Colonel Strong Vincent, the 16th Michigan, 44th New York, 83rd Pennsylvania, and the 20th Maine, a regiment that I'm sure none of you have ever heard of before. Um, Vincent's men would act as basically the flanking force to Stuart's many defensive positions that he would establish on June 21st. You can see in the bottom there of the map, Vincent's men lapping around the right end of Stuart's line at the Bittersweet Farm while the cavalry moved directly up the Ashby's Gap Turnpike, directly west on the Ashby's Gap Turnpike um, towards Stuart's cavalry itself. So the action began at Bittersweet Farm on the uh, morning of June 21st with an artillery duel that lasted about an hour. The duel was so loud that it could actually be heard many miles away in Washington, D.C. Despite the obstinacy with which the Confederates had put up uh, fights from defensive positions in the past several days, Stuart's cavalry would once again suffer uh, a terrible defeat there at the Bittersweet Farm. Wade Hampton's cavalrymen were defending that uh, position. Uh, some of his, uh, Stuart's horse artillery uh, was there as well, Hart South Carolina Battery, which were armed with Blakely rifles that you see there in the top right of English manufacture. Um, some of those Blakely rifles had actually been paid for personally for Hart's battery by none other than Wade Hampton himself, the brigade cavalry commander. But as you can see in the bottom right, uh, excuse me, in the bottom part of the screen, uh, one federal artillery shell actually struck the ammunition chest for one of those Blakely rifles. It became impossible for the Confederate troops to pull it off the field. And as the Federals seized the Bittersweet Farm Ridge, uh, Stewart's men had actually lost the first artillery piece that they had, uh, would lose during the course of the American Civil War. Uh, and so, again, another uh, very much of, of a black eye for Stuart's reputation and Stuart's personality uh, at that point. But Stuart would continue falling back from the bittersweet farm line because the terrain, as I mentioned, in the Loudoun Valley, as it moves closer to the Blue Ridge Mountains, Stuart was able to utilize many different creeks, hillsides and bridges as strong defensive positions. And so he basically leapfrog, leapfrogged throughout all of these defensive positions itself. He next fell back behind the Goose Creek Bridge, which you see there in the bottom right, a bridge that's over 200 years old that is now part of Nova Park system, and I would highly suggest visiting that. Another severe artillery duel ensued there on the uh, banks of Goose Creek Bridge. Uh, the 4th New York Cavalry, that peculiar polyglot regiment under the command of Duchesnola, Luigi uh, Palma Duchesnola on June 17th, was involved in some of the initial charges up against the Stone Bridge itself uh, over Goose Creek. One of the men involved in that charge was Captain Nehemiah Mann, ironically a Quaker, uh, 
uh, involved in the fighting there at Goose Creek. Uh, despite uh, his men suffering terrible fire from both Confederate artillery and dismounted cavalry on the west bank of Goose Creek, Mann remained mounted, uh, encouraging his men. And as one of his men wrote, it was such men as John Paul Jones and Ethan Allen were made of the same stuff as Nehemiah Mann. You won't hear uh, the end of Mann. Uh, just quite yet, but through a, an advanced uh, a force charge of both federal cavalry and federal infantry against Strong Vincent's Brigade in the 83rd Pennsylvania and 16th Michigan specifically, they were able to drive Stuart back away from Goose Creek, ultimately back to the town of Upperville itself, which sits about five miles east of the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And so now Stuart's back as uh, June 21st is carrying on. Stuart's back is really getting up to the Blue Ridge Mountains itself. And again, remember it's his objective to keep the federal eyes blind to what's going on there. The bill involved the two federal cavalry divisions now reunited, John Buford's men and um, uh, David McMurtry Gregg's uh, division of Pleasanton's Cavalry Command. And while most of the fighting to this point, at least for the Confederates, had been dismounted, uh, the fighting here at Upperville was a true uh, cavalry engagement in the truest sense of the word, a mounted engagement. And the view uh, of, of these over 10,000 mounted troopers going at each other, both north and east of Upperville, was as one soldier described it there, the panorama was one of the finest and most animating ever beheld. And because of the great state of preservation that these battlefields uh, still have today. You can still go stand at Vineyard Hill, the site of Stuart Stand east of Upperville, and see this battlefield much as it was on June 21st of 1863. But the fighting here at uh, Vineyard Hill would be incredibly desperate. You can see Alfred Wad and Alfred Wad sketch of the fighting for Vineyard Hill. You can see the vineyard sort of in the middle of his sketch itself. That's where that last photograph was taken from. And you can also see the Blue Ridge Mountains looming in the distance. A testament again to how close Jeb Stewart and his men were with their backs to the Blue Ridge Mountains itself. Jeb Stewart himself would be involved in the action, uh, leading several charges of his cavalrymen against the Federals on the eastern slopes of Vineyard Hill Cavalry Regiment in the United States Army. And as Stewart recounted to his wife in a letter just a couple of days later, uh, on four separate occasions, federal soldiers rode up right next to him within feet of him, uh, trying to kill him, but all did so in vain. And Stewart uh, repeated that fact to his wife, which I'm sure she was very pleased to read, of course, just how close he was to dying on four separate occasions at the hand of some of his former comrades there at the eastern slope of Vineyard Hill. Judson Kilpatrick himself. Uh, there in the bottom left-hand side of the screen, uh, led some of his men into action at one point. Kilpatrick himself was captured by Confederate forces. Uh, some of those federal forces that were driven back that allowed the Confederates to capture Kilpatrick was that peculiar polyglot regiment, the 4th New York Cavalry. As they were racing towards the rear, Nehemiah Mann, uh, who you saw there at Goose Creek Bridge, turned around in the saddle, realized that his brigade commander was captured, and wheeled his horse around and charged back into the fray, yelling to his men, men, are you heroes or are you cowards? Follow me, charge. Man uh, raced his horse so quickly back into the action that he went up against a about a dozen confessed by a bullet through the left shoulder that lodged in his chest. He also received, received at least one saber slash across his right cheek, which if you look closely enough in that photograph of him, you can still see the scar on his right cheek from the action there at Upperville. Incredibly, man would survive his wounds. He would help free Judson Kilpatrick from his momentary captivity. But man, unfortunately, a very brave man, uh, would be killed in a later cavalry action in the Shenandoah Valley in 1864 by a bullet through the heart. Even uh, Division Commander David McMurtry Gregg, positioned there on the right side of your screen, would get in on the action. As he was mounted on one of his favorite horses going into the fight, he felt something graze one of his legs, and slowly the horse that he was sitting on began to sink down, and it was a Confederate artillery shell that had grazed his leg and then cut across the underbelly of his horse, essentially disemboweling his horse, and the horse began to sink down to the ground. Greg, realizing that he needed a horse to lead his men into battle, yelled for one of his staff officers to get off of their horse. Greg mounted onto that horse and then continued leading his troops into the fight. However, just a couple of minutes later, Greg once again felt a nudge against one of his legs. And as he turned around to look, it was not this time a Confederate artillery shell, but instead it was his disemboweled horse who had followed him.
back into the action to nudge Greg almost as if to remind him that he had forgotten uh, about his old mount. Uh, Greg, seeing the pain that this disemboweled horse was in, yelled to one of his staff officers, staff officers, he said, for God's sake, somebody shoot him. And one of his staff officers pulled out his revolver and ended that heroic horse's life. But so often, of course, we forget about the animals that are involved in these actions in the Battle of Upperville, where so many of these horses were involved. There were just as many casualties there, equine casualties, as there were human casualties. Eventually, those Stuart's men would be driven from their positions on the east and north side of Upperville. Uh, as they were heading back towards the Blue Ridge, an engagement ensued on the west side of Upperville. Colonel Peter Evans, commanding the 5th North Carolina Cavalry, um, was very much embarrassed by the performances men had put up uh, both uh, on June 19th at Middleburg and again at June 21st uh, at Upperville. And so Evans ordered his men back into the fight. He yelled to them. He said, now, men, I want you to understand that I am going through. And he wheeled his horse back into the fight, uh, leading just a, a few of his men into the action west of Upperville. But Evans would ultimately be killed, one of the final casualties of the Battle of Upperville. And he would be the highest ranking Confederate officer to be killed in action during the battles of Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville. By the night of June 21st, Stuart and his men had pulled back to Ashby's Gap in the Blue Ridge Mountains, but they had not yielded the mountain range itself and the gaps that go through the mountain range to the Federals. And so Stuart uh, had kept Pleasanton blind as to where the Confederates were. However, Pleasanton wrote back to uh, um, um, that Basically, the knowledge of the enemy's whereabouts is not great. And what Pleasanton could tell um, Hooker was not where the Confederates were, but he could tell them where the Confederates were not. And Pleasanton reported back that there was no Confederate infantry in the Loudoun Valley in between the Bull Run and the Blue Ridge Mountains, ultimately. Uh, of course, he did not identify and could not identify Confederate infantry moving north uh, down the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, across the Potomac River into Maryland and Pennsylvania. And so Hooker's army would remain immobilized for a few more days while he continued to gather information uh, about what Lee was up to before Hooker would ultimately begin moving his army north across the Potomac River as well. So Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville, while the Federals had gained uh, a, a sizable portion of ground between Aldi and the Bull Run Mountains, they did not gain a knowledge of where Robert E. Lee and his army were or where they were up to. Despite that failed federal objective though, the battles of Aldi, Middleburg and Upperville should not re be regarded as a wash or be regarded as something that was a forgotten action sandwiched between the larger battles of Brandy Station and of course the Battle of Gettysburg itself. There are about 1,500 casualties in the five days of fighting at those three battles, about 900 federal casualties, about 600 Confederate casualties. And I think one of my favorite quotes about the fighting at Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville comes from uh, Captain Charles O'Farrell of the 12th Virginia in north of Upperville on June 21st. He had gone into the fight joking with a comrade of his about which wounds they would like to receive so that they could go back home on furlough and be away from this war for just a time. The man that he had joked with hoped that he would be wounded in the legs so that uh, he could embrace the ladies as he was sitting back at home that would come to greet him. O'Farrell joked that he would like to be wounded in the arms so that he would have his legs to get away from the Federal Cavalry. Uh, going into that action, O'Farrell would survive and his comrade would not. Charles O'Farrell eventually came to be a governor of Virginia in the late 1890s, but in his memoirs of the war, he did not want the battles of Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville to fade into the past. Instead, what he wrote is that the names of Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville were raised from obscurity and made historic. These fields, especially the last named, will figure in all time to come as the scenes of as desperate cavalry fighting as the world has ever seen. And so I hope in your studies of the Civil War, your studies of the Gettysburg Campaign, that you will not forget the fighting at Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville. And I hope too that you will be able to get out and explore the sites related to these battles because they truly are some of the best preserved Civil War battlefields that you can find uh, on, throughout all of the United States. So I'll be happy to answer any questions and I thank you all for tuning in again tonight. And uh, again, I hope that you'll get out and see some of these fields, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you all might have.
Thank you very much, Kevin. That was an extraordinary presented uh, talk this evening. Uh, those of you who have questions, uh, you're going to be remain muted. If you could send your questions uh, via the chat function that you see on the bottom of your screen. One question we've had, uh, Kevin, is can you recommend uh, any good books about these this particular uh, series of battles? Yeah, the only book that's really out there is uh, by renowned cavalry historian Bob O'Neill. It was part of H.E. Howard's Virginia Battles and Leaders series, and so it's an incredibly hard book to get. Um, but it is by far the standard on these battles. Um, so if you happen to have a copy of it or can get your hands on a copy of it, it won't be cheap, but uh, it is an excellent resource uh, to have. Um, that is the best and really only book on these actions itself. It's solely dedicated to these actions. Um, Bob, however, is, as last time I had chatted with him, he is working on a, a, a new edition of that book. So hopefully cross our fingers that that will be out here. But um, Bob as well did write an article in the Gettysburg Magazine. If I remember correctly off the top of my head, it's the July 2001 um, article uh, or issue of the Gettysburg Magazine. Um, it's an excellent treatment of the battles of Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville. Uh, and so if you can get your hands on that, that, that's great as well. And he did also do a Blue and Gray Magazine, which I know now is defunct, but he did do an issue of the Blue and Gray Magazine. I can't remember the issue itself, uh, what year, but that's another excellent source to use. Um, so I, those are the really the three sources. Bob O'Neill is, is the expert on these battles and uh, a, a lot of what I learned, in fact, I would say probably all of what I learned came from him. Uh, and so he's, he's really, if you can find anything with his name on it related to Aldi, Middleburg and Upperville, that's the gold standard. Yeah. Bob O'Neill's an excellent historian. I had the great pleasure of having a tour of Mosby sites with him and the late Horace Mewborn and the combination of the two and Jeff Wirt accompanied us as well. Uh, that was quite a trio of historians to really enlighten us about what occurred with Mosby. Um, another question was the seventh Virginia cavalry involved, uh, Jones's men involved in the fighting. They were, they were involved in the fighting along um, the Snickersville Turnpike. They were sort of on the left end of Stewart's line. And I didn't have a chance to get much into the tactics of the Battle of Upperville, but um, part of the reason that Stewart makes a stand on the east end of Upperville is to protect the trap road intersection with the Ashby's Gap Turnpike, because what he's doing is waiting for those men on the northern end of his line to get back to the Ashby's Gap Turnpike so he and his men can withdraw back to the... Um, uh, Ashby's Gap Turnpike and back to Ashby's Gap itself. And the 7th Virginia Cavalry is involved in the fighting there. There's a couple of really good stories related to the 7th Virginia Cavalry. Um, the, the Brent family that grew up about 15 miles away from Upperville would lose two sons. Uh, excuse me, they lost one son killed that day on June 21st and another one would be wounded. Uh, but they were involved in the action there yeah, on the north side of Upperville. Very good. Uh, were there any other actions that took place in the area during the American Civil War, or was it mainly raised by Mosby? Mosby is the one that takes a lot of the headlines. The other major campaign um, that takes place there that is even more overshadowed than Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville is what is referred to as the Loudoun Valley Campaign, which is the uh, campaign between basically Antietam and Fredericksburg. Uh, it's George McClellan's last campaign. But it's a series of pretty intense cavalry engagements as McClellan is making his way south through the Loudoun Valley. Uh, ultimately, his objective is to get to Culpeper Courthouse. He doesn't make it that far. He gets to Warrenton and then gets removed from command. Burnside gets put in, uh, in command. And uh, then, of course, Burnside will slide east towards Fredericksburg. Um, those actions, as I mentioned, are even more overshadowed than... Um, than the actions at Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville uh, in June of 1863. But I am crossing my fingers hoping to rectify that by working on a couple of different pieces uh, about that. So stay tuned for more information there. But of course, Mosby, uh, Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville are right in the heart of Mosby's Confederacy as it comes to be known. And um, many of Mosby's raids, if they do not occur within that uh, area will at least emanate from that area on their way towards the Shenandoah Valley, uh, the Manassas Gap Railroad, or, or uh, towards points along the Potomac River. Very good. Well, Kevin, I want to thank you again. We've had a number of kudos come in on the chat and, and uh, several from some very respected Civil War historians have also joined us this evening and uh, um, many have expressed uh, kudos for the excellent presentation this evening. I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank you for the superb work you're doing at Bristow Station. Um, 
you know, as, as one who's been involved with battlefield preservation here in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, certainly respect and appreciate what you're doing over there and congratulations on your work at, uh, at Bristow. Uh, Thank you. Again, Terry, one who's a consider membership with the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation. Uh, it's at Shenandoah at war.org. Uh, if, you, if you're a member, thank you. If you're not a member, please consider joining. And we would certainly welcome your membership and keep you informed of all the events that the Battlefields Foundation is, is um, undertaking throughout the year. We just had a superb event at Newmarket for the anniversary this past Saturday. We had a couple hundred attendees and that went over really well. We had some fine historians speak. So please consider membership and, and join the Shenandoah Battlefields Foundation. All right, our next talk will be on July 8th, I believe the date is. It's going to be um, by an author in Maine. Brian Schwartz is gonna talk about his upcoming book that's about to be published on Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Brian is a extremely well-versed and knowledgeable historian who's done a great deal of work uh, on Maine in the Civil War, which is pretty much close to my heart as well. Um, and um, uh, Brian is going to be, is working with, also working with emerging Civil War. So we're gonna be very fortunate. He's gonna be our speaker in July and you'll be receiving information on that. Keep, you know, check your email, check the Battlefield Foundation website and I guess we also post on Facebook. So to everyone this evening, thank you for attending. We appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you next, next, uh, at our next meeting in July. Have a great evening and stay safe.